Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma, the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment, back again. M- Mr. E.V. Fordham. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> that is not the way that it works. He, he has returned, and we'll talk a little bit more about what it was like for him to get married and everything uh, in the outro. But boy, do we have a fantastic episode for you guys now that we're back with the both of us. Um, and I think that I would have felt really sad doing this episode without you. So I'm really glad that we got to. You should feel sad doing all of them without me. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but especially this yeah. one. This was yeah. a uh, a great episode. Um, well, I'm going to let you. I guess yeah. I'll let you. In. I, we haven't even introduced him yet. Yeah, so. so we had on today uh, Nicholas Riley Keaton. He goes by Riley Keaton, who is uh, a politician, which we don't do a lot of around here. But he is actually a delegate Uh, from the 11th district to the West Virginia House of Delegates and has been since 2020. Uh, Now, there's lots of state representatives in this country. There's two things that make Riley very special. One, um, he's probably the state representative in this country who most believes in all of the ideas we talk about here on Moment of Truth. And two, uh, he's 24 years old. Um, he and this was not the first time he ran. The first time he ran and he came within 43 votes of winning was in 2016. Uh, he skipped 2018 and then he gave another shot at it in 2020 and he won against an incumbent probably 50 years his senior. Uh, Riley is an incredibly uh, talented, bright, aligned, and decent guy. Um, we've only known him from the Twitter machine for months now, but we got a chance to invite him to some stuff up in here in DC and um, everyone loves him and, and there's good reason for it. He has a real vision for the state of West Virginia and what he wants to do. Um, and and he's enacting it every single day and he's just, um, he's he's a white pill. Um, it's it's a fantastic episode. We talk about everything from, from that vision that he has for West Virginia. We talk about coal, we talk about rare earth minerals, we talk about destroying progressive institutions, we talk about what the good life is, what do red states face, what can red states do in this moment. Um, it's it's just, a, it was a ton of fun. And I don't know what you thought about it, Nick. Yeah, I think that Riley is a very rare, you know, breed of individual where he's very good on the ideological stuff. I think a lot of the the, the ideological framework and foundation is there. But he's also very tactical. So it's not, I think you find this a lot on Twitter. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very brilliant, have a lot of great ideas, and all they do is tweet about them or, uh, God forbid, write articles. Uh, <laughs> and the really cool thing about Riley is he's like, that's a really great idea. I'm going to write a bill to do that, you know? Uh, and, and it's just so encouraging. I mean, I say later on in the episode, but uh, I think this is like, one of the the most, I mean, Sarab said it like white pilling conversations I've had with a politician maybe ever. Yeah. Because uh, you know Riley particularly gets into the idea of talking about you know treating a a state kind of like a startup, uh, you know, and 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 being willing to try new things and have good ideas, uh, you know, to grow your state. So really engaging conversation. Riley really knows what he's talking about. Loves his state. Um, you really do love to see it. Yeah. It was a stellar episode, so make sure you listen all the way through to the end. Uh, There's something here for everyone and uh, one of the more conversational episodes we've ever done. So uh, check out AmericanMoment.org, rate and review the podcast five stars, and we'll go now to Delegate Riley Keaton. Riley, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, you are a little bit different of a guest than we have traditionally had on. You're our first state legislator, um, and you have a pretty interesting story to go with it. So why don't you walk our guests through what and how you got here? Sure, absolutely. So the uh, I came to I kind of came to politics kind of early. You know, as you can probably imagine, I'm 24 years old now, and uh, sitting in the House of Delegates in West Virginia, and. Uh, it all started like sort of what I'll call like red jersey, blue jersey sort of interest in politics of like I come from a family that is on all my father's side, of like reliably conservative Republicans and that sort of thing. And they were sort of my intro into politics originally of just, you know, watching news. Like it was not uncommon to like read the newspapers of family, that sort of thing. So 
that's sort of like the genesis of my interest in uh, politics. And then as time went on, my interest sort of moved increasingly local because uh, just of where I come from. You know, I'm, I'm from Spencer, West Virginia, which is in Roan County. Um, and sort of the way that a lot of economic, uh, like regional wealth works in West Virginia is that you're sort of, most of the money in a community comes, can be derived from like the last big boom to move through the area, right? That like you've got coal in the southern part of the state, you've got natural gas in sort of the northern part. And in my own hometown, we haven't really had anything since like the 50s, you know? So it's like a kind of a long slide, if you will, um, into, you know, losing a lot of industry and that sort of thing. So my interest became increasingly local and increasingly more maybe aligned with where I think the party's going today, uh, in large part because uh, I live my hometown. So I decided senior year of high school that I would run for House of Delegates, right, uh, against a, an appointed incumbent. Uh, that campaign is why I had like anything to do my senior year of high school. Uh, and uh, and uh, we ended up duking it out. There were three candidates and uh, I lost my 28 votes out of about 2,600 cast. Um, I took off 2018. I was in school at the time uh, at West Virginia University and uh, then made the go of it in 2020 because this was this is the election, you know, that like every year is the election, you always hear that, but like we, it does really truly feel like we live in a time that is like, you know, decades happen in weeks at this point. So uh, I got back in the hunt uh, for 2020, knocked a lot of doors, called a lot of people. Uh, COVID sort of pulled me off the doorstep uh, a lot of the time. So I called a couple thousand voters of mine and uh, lo and behold, we, uh, we got him the second time around. So, so what is the general composition of you know the the House of Delegates in West Virginia? I mean, I assume you're probably the youngest member um, among the youngest. Among the youngest, okay. Because yeah. this is kind of an interesting thing. You know, I I worked in the Minnesota House of Representatives for mm -hmm. a little while, a long time ago, mm -hmm. and almost everyone there was like mm -hmm. ancient. So, like, uh, <laughs> walk me through, you know, kind of this youthful. I guess, like movement in the House of Delegates. Yeah, so uh, we kind of had a trendsetter in the 2014 cycle that sort of made everybody think like, oh, it's plausible for, for younger people to get involved that uh, Sarah Blair uh, was elected to the House of Delegates in 2014. She won her primary at 17 years old. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, she won her primary. <laughs> documents that her parents had to sign? Uh, <laughs> like a work illegal, release, yeah. like like a work permit? I don't think so, <laughs> but uh, he, her father was a state senator, which might have had something to do with this whole thing. So yeah. the, uh, but uh, so there was sort of this like watershed moment that was like, this is plausible. This is something that we can, that could actually happen. Uh, that has sort of led to us having, I think, the largest under 25 caucus in the country. There's at least five of us, maybe six out of uh, out of a hundred members. So, wow. uh, you know, not quite representative of like our age group as a share of the population, but like way more representative than uh, I think a lot of legislatures are. So, mm -hmm. in terms of the makeup, um, we're a citizen legislature, so it's part time. Everybody has real jobs. Everybody does other things. So you end up with like a very broad cross section of the state, and I think it's a positive thing. Um, I hope I've answered your question in that. Yeah. 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 Well, and so I, I want to hear more about what that process was like in the campaign, because I have to imagine, especially uh, running against an incumbent, that there's lots of people who are like, oh, that's nice, young whippersnapper. Go, sure. go play with your toys. How did people react when, mm -hmm. at the time, a 23-year-old showed mm -hmm. up at their door and said, I would like to represent you? And, mm -hmm. and you, I mean, this it sounds like it was a campaign that involved a lot of personal interaction, mm -hmm. because you could have feasibly met with every single one of your mm -hmm. voters at some mm -hmm. point over yeah. the process. So I'll take this in kind of two angles. Like one is sort of like the generational conversation that uh, there's sort of like a donut hole in who thinks it's okay, right? Who Who's who's cool with it? And that like people our age are, like they don't even know to have a problem with it. You know, like it doesn't even occur like, oh, aren't you young to be doing this? Like we all think that we're not too young to be doing anything. And uh, so it doesn't even occur to like our cohort and then like your older folks, like uh, maybe like f early 50s plus are all like, oh, that's neat. Like they're okay with it. Uh, there's kind of this 
chunk in the middle that's your like 30 to like 45 ish mm -hmm. that are like what does he know about anything and yeah. uh and the elder millennials that right are like what is right this? which like, if there's any group of people like any generation that if i had to pick one to not like me older millennials work yeah so. older millennials some of yeah. the younger gen x are right so. right so um and then they're still getting their life together, you know. They're, they're, right? They're still yeah. Figuring out what's going on. Yes. What are you doing? Being they're on, yeah. they're on yeah. cat number five. Uh, exactly. Kids, exactly. Yeah, you know. exactly. What do you know about uh, representing me? me. <laughs> oh, so, it, so that's kind of like from the generational angle, and then really like the message is just like my family's been in Roan County or a county that touches it since 1820, right? Uh, on my father's side and goes further back among on my mom's side, but we sort of lose some track of those records. But like, I like, I'm thoroughly a product of my hometown. So there's still some familiarity to it all. The district's 17,000 people. And like, my family's like been there a long time. You know, there's still some basic familiarity and like, I can believe that it's true that Riley is doing this because he cares, you know? So that is, something that I think that you might lose if you were running in a much larger race than mine, but uh, that I have like a sincere interest in the community and like a sincere love for my hometown. So, yeah. yeah. What, uh, what were the big themes of the race at the time that you ran it? Obviously it was a very different campaign probably mm -hmm. in 16 than it was in mm -hmm. 20. Uh, what, what, what did you run on? Yeah, so a lot of my uh, campaign messaging at, was like very realignment adjacent, you know, of uh, talking a lot about like placing your interests over all other interests. I would say it in the, express it in those terms too, that like uh, there are some issues that are like very West Virginia that I don't want to like bore everybody with, but things like we had a road bond in 2017 that was the vast majority of the money spent on new construction and things like that while like infrastructure decayed in a community like mine, that you have people that haven't had the roads paved in like decades. You know, that mud fork is the one that comes to mind in my hometown that like hasn't been paved in decades. And like we're putting new interstate lanes in like the already prosperous north central part of the state. So um, really of just talking about like, here's what I think we need, right? Here is what I think um, your representative should be saying, identifying a lot of um, cultural issues and a lot of like distributional economic issues and talking about that you know and, and saying here's what i think on those those sorts of things like heavy emphasis on infrastructure heavy emphasis on broadband on all of it sort of culminating in this good family supporting jobs message that was sort of the the whole idea is that you should be able to have a single earner household if you want and that was like the main policy thrust that was the main message of the whole thing is that if you want to keep people my age, attract people my age, then like you need to be the best place in America to start a family. And you can compete for a lot of people that nobody's competing for right now. So what's the general makeup of, of people that live in your district? This is a lot of people like yourself who have kind of grown up in families for uh, you know a long time, in some cases, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, or is it, yeah, just kind of like yeah. walk us through the makeup. So I come from a very like native heavy district. Yeah. Uh, I mean, lots and lots of families have been there a long time. Uh, there are other parts of the state that that is not the case for, that you have a, like a healthy amount of transplants. You know, the Eastern Panhandle, Morgantown area, some to some extent, the Northern Panhandle. Uh, so yeah, I'm very native heavy mm -hmm. in my district. When, uh, when you first ran mm -hmm. uh, in, in 2016, um, was there, a sense uh, that you were part of a new generation of Republicans or conservatives running for office on the coattails of the president at the time? Or was it less kind of realized than that? Yeah, I don't think that it was uh, conceptualized to the extent that like, I don't, my, my, pol my political involvement is still very much a local thing. Mm -hmm. Like I, I put it in my mind as like a very local thing. That's what's been made kind of this trip to DC and this sort of thing has been like a different experience for me because my, my political involvement is so hyper local in my mind mm -hmm. uh, of like, whenever I, I talk about my district with people, I'm literally thinking about like the route that I drove to elementary school every morning. You know what I mean? That like, mm -hmm. it, it's this hyper local thing. So 
did I conceptualize it as part of this broader national movement the first time around? Uh, less so than I did in 2020. Um, in 2020, it very much did feel like that. Um, and I, I kind of tried to take advantage of that. And my favorite like political statistic, my favorite election statistic, uh, is in the primary, you know, there's this thing called ballot drop-off that the most people vote for the office at the top of the ticket. And then as you move further down, fewer and fewer people vote. So in my home county, we had 2010 votes for president, right? In the Republican primary. And then by the time you got to um, House of Delegates, my race, we had 2005. So there was this big, I only had five ballot drop off. Wow. So we held like all the Trump guys. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I conceived of it a lot more as like part of a bigger thing in 2020 than 2016. So conceptually, was there a big difference between the campaign that you ran in 16 and in, in, in 20? Uh, I would say so, yes. Yeah. And part of it, like not to sound like curmudgeonly or what have you but like being older and experiencing the ripe old age of 23, 23 versus yes, being 20, 18, 20. yeah well and really about like experiencing the university system and like the mediocrity of everybody we're told to respect <laughs> um, <laughs> that yeah. that that had like a a particular cycle because like you know my professor my teachers in school were not like particularly credentialed you know i mean they're they're bas you know and like mm -hmm. not particularly credentialed and like firmly local creatures you know like local people so like my source my the reason i was supposed to ascribe credibility to them was like very different from whenever i get to college it's like oh this person's supposed to like know everything about what they're going to tell me and like give me actionable things and like ed be an edifying influence on my life and uh that when that was not the case, you know, like that's kind of like a red pill moment. Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so West Virginia is a particular state, is sure. a particular place. Mm -hmm. And the challenges that that state mm -hmm. faces are unique. And, and you've made your public witness, the campaigns oh, you've run, sure. and, and now your tenure in the legislature mm -hmm. all about the local and the particular what are the biggest challenges facing a state like West Virginia yeah. today? Yeah, so our age pyramid is an hourglass uh, that's smaller at the bottom, right? That it's, uh, I mean, our story is like very much connected to like the story of the whole country, like the archetype of like what the 2016 election meant. All of that like applies doubly so to West Virginia that um, kind of these combined forces of like cultural and economic liberation you can sort of see uh, like a high, highly concentrated effect of that on my home state that you've got um, on the economic side, just like a, the desolate decimation of industry, you know, of like the idea of a decent fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year job with a pension, with health insurance that is based in a given place that there is like some kind of lifelong relationship and shared responsibility between employer and employee. That's like what built communities like my hometown and it doesn't exist anymore. So on the economic liberation and then on the cultural liberation, you kind of have like, uh, there are whole school districts where like two, three quarters of uh, kids are getting raised by grandparents because of addiction issues, because broken homes, uh, just like societal collapse. I don't, like, I don't want to be too, sound too melodramatic about yeah. it, but just like a societal collapse. And that sort of manifests as like declining population because you don't have like rates of family formation. You have like people dying prematurely um, and just like an overall like despair that is the, the big enemy, right? It's just this overall despair that's come from like, that's come from this moment that we've, I guess not a moment, but this the several decade journey uh, toward like no more responsibilities to other people, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like, um, the big issues are all metastasized as uh, population loss. So you kind of get it. Economic decimation, cultural liberalism, all of this stuff sort of metastasizes that way. So I'm curious as to, you know, I think there are, there's kind of been this resurgence of young people design, deciding to, to, to stay in the communities that they grew up in, at least maybe it's just being covered more. I, sure. I, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I know that for 
Gen Xers and millennials specifically, I mean, a lot of the, the drive, uh, you know, in their early 20s and, and 30s and that sort of thing is just to get out, right? To just get away from their communities, get to the big cosmopolitan city. Uh, and we've seen how that hasn't worked. Why did you stay in West Virginia and... Is there like some kind of pathway there, some kind of answer or story that could, um, you know, potentially lead to, to, to kind of turning this population drain around? Yeah. So um, I said in my inaugural speech, like whenever I, I got sworn in and I sort of just had my a room full of like family, friends, supporters, uh, I told them like, you know, love is when you uh, want the best for something in the same way that you like want food when you're hungry and drink when you're thirsty. And like, I really do love my hometown, you know, like for all of its like smallness and all of its warts and all of its like, there's nothing to do and that sort of thing. Right. That, uh, I do love my hometown. And, uh, so that's the primary motivating factor for my own decision to stay. Like no one is coming, you know, like if not me, who like I have a, I have a, I like to think that I have a brain for solving problems and like I definitely have a heart for my hometown, you know, mm. so like if I don't do this sort of thing, who will, you know, yeah. so that was a big reason for like my own personal decision to stay. But you're exactly right that getting people um, like creating new reasons to kind of to divest from the like the urban model, the metropolitan mm. model uh, is really good. We've done a lot of that in West Virginia, um, kind of my biggest achievement like the things that i'm I'm proudest that we've done as a legislature in that regard is the hope scholarship program which is an education savings account program that basically makes all state education dollars portable if a family chooses homeschool chooses private school chooses these sorts of things that it gives people a reason to live there uh gives people that sort of think the way that we might a reason to choose a place to live so uh, i hope i've answered your question with that one but uh yeah yeah um it's, it seems like the narrative at the national level when it comes to states like West Virginia, and, and I use the term like because, you know, sometimes the particular example is Ohio or a different mm-hmm. Appalachian state. But, but West Virginia, I really do think, is, is the prime example of it, is that all of these problems have been tied to the opioid crisis. That is the big reason that these states are having a bad time. And you see kind of a a certain kind of very neoliberal approach to it. It's like, if only we can fix that opioid problem, you know, everything will be fine. What is dissatisfying to you about the narrative around that issue specifically that you see at the national level? Yeah, so the, like the national conversation a lot of the time ends up being things like, oh, like, what if we put another $10 billion into opioid treatment? Maybe that'll fix everything. And it's that it's this very, like, like, there's a policy lever that you just, like, like, why don't we pull the anti-opioid policy lever and, like, bada-bing, bada-boom, where, like, it's gone. Why don't we just do that? And that's just not living in reality, that drugs fill a vacuum, right? So the removal of drugs leaves a vacuum, right? That the drugs... I've got a dear friend who's like struggled with addiction and uh, like he's a major success story at this point. And uh, in like his whole, when I ask him to like talk about his story, um, he'll just say like, I had nothing left, you know, like his family situation is a mess, work disaster, education disaster, what have you, right? Personal relationships disaster. So he's like, like I had no life to fill up my time with. So that's where drugs came in. So to treat it as like, oh, you need to fix the addiction problem. You need to like turn the knob on the addiction issue is not reality. You have to like rebuild communities, rebuild institutions to use the word, right? You have to like connect people to other people to fill up their lives again. So. Well, and that's the thing. It's these, it's these people, these elites in charge shifting blame right it's it's not no no no. like shoot we destroyed your community your livelihood and everything that you and your family have, has enjoyed for generations let's fix that it's oh these people are just like dumb and drug addicted yeah. so if like we just put them in treatment centers we'll fix it uh you know these these are frequently called 
deaths of despair. I think mm-hmm. you could also yes. call them deaths of idleness, right? Sure. Like if you if you don't have anything to do, you don't have people to go see, you don't have a way to support a family, mm-hmm. like you're going to get stuck with some vice, whether it's mm-hmm. depression, drugs, whatever. Sure. Um, so I think I think you know really what Sarab is kind of getting at is like it's. It's a blame game. Yes. I think I think I think yeah. people are trying to like shift the blame for some of these communities falling behind off their shoulders and say, well, you know, only if these sure. people weren't so dumb and drug addicted. Yeah. My line on this sort of thing is like a lot of people where I come from get managed as liabilities by people in charge as opposed to like ever getting treated like an asset. And like Absolutely. the point that I've made to like our workforce folks is like they have the same 40 waking working hours that everybody else does that like our biggest untapped natural resource is like the idleness you know what i mean that there's a lot of people that could do a lot of things and uh yeah yeah um the the other side of the equation is is often um you know if they were actually if if our ruling class was actually held accountable Mm -hmm. for the consequences of of what they've wrought on communities like west virginia over the Mm -hmm. last half century Mm -hmm. um they would not be put in charge anymore and and this exists on on left and right i i feel like the very prevailing it's bipartisan but but the thing that the left loves to talk the most about these days when it comes to states like west virginia is the opioid crisis and then if you peel back and you look at what maybe conservative establishment types would traditionally say is that they would love to talk about things like the success sequence, right? You know, get married, um, don't have kids out of wedlock, get as much education as you can, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, I, and I worry that it's sometimes said with a very similar tone as the opioid stuff. It's yeah. that these people would be fine if they would only, you know, not have children and go to a four-year college. Right. Uh, what is, what's your sense about that side of the equation, yeah. the conservative version? Yeah, so I think that... Um, kind of the way that I would go about it is that you can't have like like your hypothetical economic reality but you can't place that on a higher like plane of existence than like basic biological reality is that like something I say a lot is like men younger than me storm the beaches of Normandy with children at home like what have I been doing <laughs> right and uh so like you can't change the fact that like people in their 20s will have children period right that like that will happen. That is like a biological reality will happen. And if you try to say like, well, they shouldn't so that the market can function, doesn't really, it just doesn't work. It's not real life. And so like, what's the problem with the success sequence is that like, they need to be able to work 40 hours a job that facilitates their marriage, right? That don't have children out of wedlock. Okay, well, like, you need more people in wedlock, you know, in order to to make that claim. And if you've, uh, and if you sort of subordinated all of that sort of cultural, like, norm around, like, yes, get married, and here is how you can do it. It's feasible. You can own your own home. You can do everything you want. They, um, if you don't have the economic realities underpinning that, it's impossible to sort of say, like, wag your finger and say, do the do the success sequence. And how is that? going i mean i I, i'm 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 not like broadly like please give us a no uh i like in the legislature you know i mean i'm sure you're 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 collaborating with a lot of people um you know on the republican side of the aisle who who probably have a different perspective you know maybe grew up more like during the reagan years and that sort of thing so i mean how are those conversations going with fellow members yeah well so like the best part about working in state government right is that like people are still basically good that like I have low confidence that like the majority of Congress are like moral people, right? <laughs> like, and I get very skeptical that they might be trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Th- th- this is an old bit of mine, which is that, mm-hmm. uh, I, when I was doing a lot of young conservative stuff back in Texas, I would, I would tell people, you know, I will have done my job correctly. Uh, if basically you have a particular attitude about something and it's it's backed by this reason the attitude being is that when you're at an event and someone comes around and it's like oh great you know the the line for pictures with the politician has started i want that kid to say that's great the line for pictures with me has started right here like to to not be 
uh, inspired by it, and, and it's based off the assumption it's like, no, it's not that politicians are better people than you. It's not the case that they're just like us. In yeah. fact, you can make a pretty robust generalization that the median politician is worse than the median person. person. Sure, yeah. Absolutely. Present company accepted. Right, yeah. well, I appreciate the confidence. Yeah. The, uh, but like in, in the House of Delegates, like they're just like good people trying to do the right thing. Like you can, there are very few people that when I'm talking to them, I don't feel like they're talking with me about the problem. You know what I mean? Like there are some people that like, and I imagine that this is way more prevalent in Congress, that when you talk with them, they're really thinking like, what are some people going to think about this? Like what are some groups going to think about this? Uh, special interests, if you will. Um, various lobbies, that sort of thing. Like that doesn't really enter into West Virginia state politics very much in my experience. Um, but how is like the dealing with like the Reaganite and like the caricature of the Reagan years um, is a challenge. It always, I imagine that it is everywhere, you know. Um, but people start to understand the, what, a watershed moment has been like the over wokening of business that um, I introduced. I'm the lead sponsor in our critical race theory bill in the state, our critical race theory ban. Uh, and it's kind of it would be the most expansive in the country, covering workplaces, covering universities, covering all organizations that receive taxpayer funding, schools, all that sort of thing. And like the char the cast of characters that came in to like quietly lobby the speaker against it was like a watershed moment for some of my colleagues that are like, oh wow, like this trade association that's endorsed me reliably, that I get a pack check from, that all these things, like maybe we don't see nearly as eye to eye as I thought we did. So that's been like, there's progress, there's like signs of life, you know, and that's, I owe that all to the fact that like they're still basically good people trying to do the right thing and they're willing to learn. So what are some of the other big initiatives that you're working on right now, um, especially ones that are infused with this more realigned perspective sure. on the issues that we think about? Critical race theory is obviously the mm -hmm. biggest issue in the country right now. I sometimes worry that a lot of Republicans are using it sort of as a yeah. vehicle to just yeah. grandstand, whereas yes. you seem like you want to put actual teeth in it. Uh, what are the other things you're working on? Yeah, so I agree with you that like CRT, people use it as like cover. Yeah. You know, that like you don't have to like care about working people on any other <laughs> issue as long as you're like hitting the headlines, right? And like masks, mm -hmm. CRT, that sort of thing. So other things that uh, I really want to see the state go in the direction of is that like Broadly pro-family policy, like some more normie Republican talking points on that are like, we have like terrible marriage penalties in like nearly every state program. Uh, our tax rates don't like double, like our tax brackets don't double the way like nearly everybody else does when uh, when you like are married and filing jointly, you know what I mean? Like, like it's the same regardless of whatever. So um, there are some like normie things to do on uh, on tax policy and the like. But then like getting like really aggressive on pro-family stuff, I think would be very, very attractive to people and do a lot to help. Um, so maybe some things like down payment assistance for married families with children. Uh, I'm going in that direction with a lot of things. And then there's also like a more broad, um, like utilizing the court system, which we've had a lot of success with in the last like nine months as conservatives. You know, you've got like DeSantis's tech legislation that all is based on uh, like creating causes of actions and things like that. I introduced the exact same bill. Very good. And, um, and then you've got like the Texas abortion law is a really good like utilization of this sort of like litigation style of enforcement. So, um, yeah, tri trial lawyers are 21st century mercenaries. And, you know, yeah. half a millennium ago, yeah. they would have been literal like soldiers, mm -hmm. you know, that were for hire. And today we have yeah. trial lawyers. And so we may as well use them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, you know, absolutely. turn the trial lawyers on this, our ideological enemies. Yeah. So this is actually a fascinating thing that uh, I don't know if you're familiar with alienation of affection no, suits. It's... OK, so it's like an old thing from common law that like nearly every state, but North Carolina and like maybe one or two others have gotten rid of that basically says that like a party who is like the victim for lack of a, like who has served the divorce, okay, in a marriage can like sue a third party for alienation of affection, okay, that is like you interfered with the marriage, like suing the boyfriend, 
right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's been a lot of like the historical application yeah. of it. And uh, there was actually like a judgment brought against like a North Carolina representative under like who like slept with a staffer or something uh, that was sued in state court in North Carolina and had judgment brought against him for alienation of affection of this guy's marriage. Which so like. Maybe we should like rediscover the value of the alienation of affection toward, yeah, right? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and you and you can like there's all sorts of room for creative stuff like that. I think this is what Hamilton's mistress's husband used to right. blackmail yes. him. Yes. Was yes. like, Sir, you have slept with my wife right. and therefore yes. she doesn't love me anymore. Please give me five hundred dollars. Well, yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but now like to like adapt it to even like twenty first century circumstances, like can you craft the cause of action in such a way that, like, you could hit the porn companies yeah. based on conduct, not on content? Because, like, they have all the 230 Let's protections. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> that they have all the 230 protections for, like, what their content goes on their platform. But, like, their conduct as a platform should still be, like, justiciable. So there's all sorts of cool stuff that you can do at the state level uh, and that I want to work on. Yeah. Uh, those are just a couple. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, yeah, it, it seems mm-hmm. like... There's so many interesting ways that, and this is the, I mean, this is part of a broader narrative that I've been harping on for a long time, is that even in the realm of traditionally social issues, uh, especially at the national level, social conservatives' imagination is so restricted. Yes. Like, there's so much more they could do. Mm-hmm. Uh, utilizing things like the internet and, and tools that are not, that have not been available historically to to advance their ends, and they just they just don't do it. Uh, the pornography one's a really interesting thing too. I mean, why why can't West Virginia just ban pornography within yeah. its borders? Yeah. So the, I mean, this all goes back to like my overall like development model for the state. Like, even if you take as a given that like seventy percent of young people, whatever you define that to mean, that seventy percent of young people, and I don't think it's this high, want like craft beer and live music as like the way that you think of like, oh, our city's going to attract young people, right? 70% is a big number, but 30% nobody's competing for. You know, nobody's trying to be like... Trad utopia. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yes, like trad capital of America is what I call it. Yeah, that nobody's trying to be like trad capital of America. But if you have like the best school choice, if you're like the least porned up state, you're like all of these things that are like, Someone like aligned with us would say like, I want to raise kids there. That's good. So that's good. So I'll tell you, it, it, my father-in-law, the thing he loves most about West Virginia, I, I told him this the first time I was in, I think, North Carolina, like, like meeting the family and okay. he and I went for like a walk together in the woods and we were talking about, he was saying, you know, how like decades ago you could, you could see, like he could see the Milky Way at night and now like light pollution is crazy. You yeah. can't see it anymore. Yes. Yeah. And I told him, I said, I know there's this, I forget where it is now, but there's this place. In, yes. There's yeah. a place in West Virginia, yeah. you know, where they don't, uh, I believe it's like radio um so no radio uh like no electricity past a certain hour i yeah. think it's like a it's a box around green bank telescope yeah that uh is supposed to like like it interferes with it yeah i know exactly yeah. what you're talking about yeah and so i was telling him about this and now it, like seriously every time i'm down there he pulls up he's like looking at the light pollution maps and he's like i need to find a house right here uh so hank listens to this podcast regularly so this is for you hank but uh but yes he uh i i do want to go out there and visit i think Absolutely. it'd be very cool so trad utopia with no light pollution right trad utopia no light pollution and there are all sorts of things that we don't consider like quality of life issues issues that are things like light pollution or like the porn issue you know that like the water water. yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. we had a conversation about that earlier and the so just there are all sorts of things that you can be like really different on and if you're trying to like have a value proposition as a state you know if you're like treating it like a startup the like we got to work on a value proposition and doing things that nobody else is doing is the best way to do that so i really i really like that view what you just said like treating it like a startup Mm -hmm. i think I really think that this should be kind of the, the the way forward for a lot of these smaller red states is you can you can kind of look back at you know your state history and have a ton of value for it and and kind of want to build a a, a, a future model uh, kind of based on you know getting back to basics uh, so for West Virginia aside from being a trad utopia that bans porn and 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 
like reduces light pollution uh, <laughs> and microplastics in the water. Uh, uh, what what do you think red states should be looking at in terms of you know kind of I guess treating their economies and their population and their and their service offerings like a startup? Yeah. So uh, I don't know how generalized I can be with this answer, but the like for West Virginia, our biggest resource that's completely undeveloped. Uh, if we have like this great realignment of supply chains back to the United States that I think will end up being like the story of the 21st century, like this big realignment of supply chains here, you can't do it without a state like West Virginia, that we have the best metal metallurgical coal in the world, right? Metallurgical coal makes steel. Uh, and that like, if we want to literally rebuild the country, then like we're going to need a heavy, heavy emphasis on a state like West Virginia's metallurgical coal resources. And on the other side of that process, uh, you've got rare earth elements like out the wazoo contained in our coal waste. So you can like clean up the state at the same time that you process these things. So like identifying unique strengths, kind of like looking at the looking at the story of like what the rest of the 21st century is going to look like. You know, like what are we going to need? How can we make our state nationally significant economically? Um, I think that is a really good way of doing it for West Virginia. I think it's in like the critical minerals space and Met coal. So um, but that's going to be very different state by state by state. I do think that um, I aspire to have like a world where like they're all like the states are trying to compete with who can be the most pro family in the way that they're currently competing to have like the lowest top marginal tax rate, you know, that like there's that like, oh man, like we have to increase our down payment assistance for, <laughs> for young families because like Virginia across the border is just like up dust by 2K a kid or something like that, you know? Yeah, I mean, it has been kind of wild. I've had some some friends, uh, man, I can think of like three or four people off the top of my head that I went to. I was actually talking to someone at my wedding about this. Uh, uh, um, three or four friends from college in Minnesota whose parents are moving to either Montana or Wyoming or like one of these red states. Because living in Minnesota, they, they, they can't take it anymore, you know? And it's almost all over um, vaccine mandates, over, um, you know, public restrictions and, and, and a lot of the critical race theory stuff and that sort of thing. Um, so I think you're totally right. I think, I think yeah. the, all of these states, I mean, should be competing against each sure, other for I, sure. I had a friend that he was like, we were involved uh, in student government together in college and like pretty apolitical guy, right? Like generally has conservative leanings, but like it's not like a big part of his life by any stretch of that imagination. And he had, he got accepted to WVU for like a grad program, like in like business or something. And like had given them an indication, like I'll be there, right? And this was in like January of 2020, like maybe December, 2019. And then he gets accepted to like, like some school in Florida. I don't remember, like maybe USF or something like that. And uh, he literally like called WVU back and was like, hey, listen, I'm not like, sorry, but like, I don't want to wear a mask anymore. <laughs> I don't want to like, I want to go be in a free state. So like we lost somebody to Florida because uh, because we had some pretty like heavy COVID restrictions later into the process than a lot of people did. So I see exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I do. I, I love the concept that you've laid out for for treating the state like a startup and, and having these entrepreneurial qualities. I do wonder, though, and, and I sometimes worry about this sort of uh, talk, especially at the national level, especially in intellectual circles, uh, that it can almost seem dismissive to, and I know this is not where your heart is, sure. uh, to the people that are already there, right? Yeah, uh, that, that that it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's treating them as a as a playground yeah. uh, and yes. and with every new you know wealthier person that wants to raise a family that you bring into West Virginia that's going to be housing costs well, going up sure, although I, I my understanding is that in a state like West Virginia the problem is not increasing housing costs it's actually depreciating home values sure. are a bigger problem sure. how, how do you think about the tension behind having respecting whose state it already is yeah. versus yeah. making it a great state to go to? This is a really, really good question. It's one that nobody, like I try to get my colleagues to ask sometimes, is that like 
and, and we, we know how Republicans traditionally get this wrong, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and again, you don't have this perspective, but there are Republican governors and state legislatures in this country that go around uh, the country and the world panhandling with a bucket yeah, saying, yeah. multinational corporation, yeah. please, please bring your entire please, workforce please. Yeah. to my state. Yes. We don't yeah. have to name names, but we're right. we <laughs> all I mean, thinking of several people. Yeah, we yeah. all know yeah. what it is. And you know it, I know it, pretty much the whole world knows it. And the, uh, so the, this is a really good point. And the trade-off in it is that like, I have this belief that like elementary schools and churches are sort of like the things that communities are made of, mm-hmm. you know, that like it's the, it's the sort of thing that um, like you don't have a community without those things. They're, they're the literal like rubber meeting the road, right? So, uh, what happens in like a graying state like West Virginia? Like what happens when like every, like all ch- childbearing age people are like gone, right? Like what is the in conclusion of that is that you have like a collapse of all of these community institutions, right? That like, I ask myself frequently, like looking at my own parish, like who is going to like be in the choir in 10 years? You know what I mean? Like I know it's a little morbid, but of like who is going to be in the choir and like, 10, 15 years, who's going to be the parish council president, Mm -hmm. who's going to do these things. And like, like all due respect folks that are already here, we do really need like to keep to like Mm self-perpetuate, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is a very different, the the, the problems facing a state like West Virginia, and this is where the red state category breaks down a little mm -hmm. bit, are very different than the problems facing a state like Texas. Texas. Yeah. Like Texas has too rapid of population growth. And that's why like property tax are going out the wazoo and it's a big problem. Whereas Mm -hmm. in West Virginia, the problem is that doesn't have enough. To manage growth or reverse decline are the two problems. Well, I think this is an interesting thing too, is that uh, I think a distinction needs to be drawn between the kind of people that you're trying to attract, right? So, so in, in treating a state like West Virginia or Wyoming or Montana or whatever as a startup, we're not saying there's going to be a Starbucks, you know, in the middle of every downtown, right. yes. um, you know, that you can take your kids to to get a sugary milkshake. Uh, <laughs> I think what we're saying is we want to try to innovate and, and create new programs, not that are going to draw godless cosmopolitans, yes. but that are going to draw people who maybe draw people back home who, yeah. who left or draw people who came from communities with similar values, who are willing and want to, and have a have kind of this longing for assimilation. Um, you know, there, there, there. I mean, I know plenty of uh, you know expats from Minnesota who have come out to to you know the D.C. area, and because they they you know. I mean, a lot of people work remote now, but there are a lot of people that have made like rural Virginia their home mm-hmm. because they miss, you know, sure, small yeah. town Minnesota. Uh, they don't really, they, you know, maybe their parents are gone. They don't have a lot to go back to, but they want to assimilate into a community. And so I think in my opinion, those are probably the people that yeah. that West Virginia is trying to draw, Look, people with West Virginia values, yeah, yes, right? Absolutely. And, and the, the kind of on the like rising housing costs and like how this relates to folks who are who live in the state is that like we have some of the highest rates of like ownership you know of like people owning like generational farms generational ownership of homes uh world economic forum uh, yes state. yes exactly 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 you'll all own something and you'll be happy <laughs> and uh so the like like we don't have the problem that you're talking about with Texas in that like we don't have a huge renter population, we don't have these sorts of, and so whenever you have like people adding to like the cultural life, mm. not changing the cultural life, but adding to it, increasing it, perpetuating it, um, like our culture, what we believe, who we are, that's sort of unambiguously good because it, on just the raw economic side of things, it's translating into like more wealth, that higher housing costs in another place would be a big problem because, you know, a huge amount of renters and that sort of thing. But uh, that's like the only thing that our people own, yeah. <laughs> right, well, is their home. Yeah. And the galaxy brain take here is like cultural appropriation is good. Like, right. you know, I, I, I go, to, listen, 
I've, I've mentioned Minnesota a lot. I go down to North Carolina, I appropriate a Southern accent, okay? Yeah, like, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, oh, that's yeah. part of my family now. You know, it's where my wife's from. Yeah. And so, I'm the ridiculous my... Indian kid who says howdy and wears cowboy boots. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, cultural appropriation mm-hmm. is good. Mm-hmm. You, you, you should want to assimilate into the place that you're going to, you know, you're going to live your life. Yeah. And you want to be a part of your community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to dig a little bit more into some of the, the tangible economic stuff that, that West Virginia is dealing with. And I, and I think some of your approach and, and also the story of the state can be typified in, in those two substances you mentioned in coal and in rare earth minerals. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, I, I, I think it's, it's almost poetic how much it, it represents uh, kind of where the state is and, and where it could be in, in 20 years. Um, you know, w- when I hear a lot of, like, usually lefties, like I remember when, like, Paul Jean Swear Engine was running and everything, right. like, they, they tend to talk <laughs> a lot about, a lot. yeah, like, <laughs> Hillary, Hillary Clinton, like, mm-hmm. the coal jobs are something mm-hmm. to be gone past for mm-hmm. them. They say, all right, the era of this is over. And when they say the coal jobs are, are it's time for them to go, what they really mean is that, anything blue collar anything where you work with your hands like you will all mm-hmm. go be service you know economy workers now mm-hmm. um a how, how do you think about the coal issue in mm-hmm. in the state of west virginia and then uh tell me about how you think the the rare earth mineral thing can can fit into it yeah so um west virginia coal made the steel that beat the nazis right like west virginia coal made the steel that saw the Soviet Union come and go, right? So the like, environmentalists are Hitler. Right. <laughs> I mean, you, listen, you said it, not me. The, uh, uh, it's the famous, like, don't make me tap the sign. Like, envi- <laughs> in, environmentalists are, like, the best bad guys in movies yeah, because yeah. because they, like, actually hate you. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. because uh, they want to make your life like, worse. Or, it's a yeah. Yes, bunch yes yeah. yeah. And the, um, so, like, West Virginia coal, like, kept America free through the, 2000, the, through the 20th century. So, like, it's not just that, like, oh, please let me, please let us keep doing our thing. Like, we're not, like, this, like, 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 bygone fishing village or something that, like, well, it, guys, it's just that there's this, like, industrial fishing industry now that, like, you're, you're obsolete or whatever. Like, you're not, you don't have to do us a favor, yeah. right? You don't have to be doing us a favor by, like, letting us do the coal thing. It's, like, nationally significant, it's something that we are contributing to, like, the freedom and the economic independence of the country. And then that's doubly so about the 21st century as it pertains to rare earth minerals and critical elements that, um, like, you can't make an iPad in the United States. Like, there, there aren't, isn't the equipment to make an iPad in the United States, and we don't have the supply chains to do it. It's just, like, if you can't get any of the things that are on the shelves in your stores on your own, you have to get them from another country then like you aren't self-determining anymore you can't make your own decisions you can't um you're not free or you're less free at least right so in the same way that west virginia coal made the steel that beat the nazis and communism in the 20th century i think that like west virginia rare earth minerals uh can you know make the consumer goods the tech the advanced manufacturing that sees like global uh like vaguely Chinese communist sort of thing fall in the 21st century. So nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were uh, you were telling me last night at uh, at dinner that you had listened to the uh, like the Arctic policy episode that that yeah. that uh, Sarab. I sat you know in sure. your seat and I talked a lot. That's the only reason that you are not technically the youngest guest on Moment of Truth. Is <laughs> Nick is technically the youngest guest on Moment of yeah. Truth at that t- point in time. Uh, But, uh, you know, I talked a lot in that episode about kind of the battle uh, between the United States and China on rare earth minerals in Greenland. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's very bizarre to me that we're like spending hundreds of millions of dollars like competing somewhere else, you know, when we kind of have that resource right here. Uh, So, you know, what specifically are you kind of envisioning you know doing on this on this issue in west virginia yeah so So, and this is a problem that happens across the country and whenever you ask me like what red state should do more of um raid the ip stock of your public universities that uh like 
I'm exploring the idea of like some mandatory tech transfer sort of things, like mandatory commercializing partners, because your universities, your state universities, all your like R1 research institutions, all like taking all of this federal money, taking a bunch of state support, like competing for like Department of Energy grants is the one that like pertains to rare earths. Yeah. Um, and like they hoard the IP. Um, I had the the guys who run the program, the Rare Earth Research Project uh, with at WVU in front of the Economic Development Committee like two, three weeks ago. And I asked like, so what are you doing to like turn it into a company? Like I understand like you're working on the technology. Do you have somebody who's going to commercialize? And he's like, well, we're not at that stage of the process. I'm like, okay, well, what at what stage do you have somebody who's going to make this an industry? And they're like, mm, I don't know. And then the chairman kind of tried to take up for him, like, Riley, I'm sure they'll license it, right, when it's done. And I'm like, will you, will you license it? You know, that was my next question. Will you license it? I'm like, that's a possibility. I'm like, so you possibly don't. And then I kind of, I really kind of got on him of like, so it's possible that you would like WVU to own and operate uh, all rare earth extraction and refinement in the state of West Virginia. Like, that's also a possibility. I'm like, yeah, I'm not okay with that. That, that, that doesn't fly, right? Yeah. So um, we're not going to use our state's most precious resource to underwrite your gender studies program. Yes, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And like, it has to do with like WVU basically want to be its own like country or what have you. But the, and like, they all do. They're all like secessionists at heart. They all hate America, and the, <laughs> so so they're all secessionists at heart, and um, and like don't want to be associated. With, God forbid, West Virginia, yeah. right? So uh, like mandatory tech transfer is sort of like the big one that I'm really interested in. Maybe look into some more like advanced purchase agreements because it's gonna be a little bit more expensive to get the minerals out of out of like coal waste than it is to like dig a mine like the Chinese do and like yeah. just pull them out of the ground that way. So your landscape isn't gonna look like Swiss cheese by the end though. Right, so yeah. that's the as one benefit. Fact, as a matter of fact, it's like environmentally conscious to do this because yeah. like the slurry ponds and what have you will be gone at the end of it. Like we'll refine it, clean it up. So, Dude, okay. this is so awesome. This is like the best <laughs> conversation I've had with a politician like right. ever. So. Like I'm excited. Let's 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 have a podcast in West Virginia. Yeah, like right. let's well, just go. We'd love to have you. Yeah. So. And, and I think the reason this is so white pilling is because you actually have a vision for what you want to do. And and I think that that's, that's my final question is, what does West Virginia look like in 25 years if you get your way? Right. Like what, what is what is the trad utopia of right, West Virginia? Right, right, right. Um, you know, the, the independent republic of yeah. Tradistan. Right, what, right. What, what, what is going, what, what do you want your state that you love to look like sure. I, on every dimension, social, economic, cultural, um, what, what does that look like? This, like, this is one of the ones that I don't localize, right? That like, that it's not necessarily like, what I want for West Virginia is what I want for like, literally every human being to, that has ever existed and will ever exist, is that like, a, like a society that stems from their basic human dignity and what that what it means to be human like a humane society that like that like we have children right like we we love our families we have an attachment to our homes you know like we like the familiar we um we live in places we have it like we're naturally spiritual we believe in the transcendental like all these things that are just like like all everything i just said having children loving a family, loving a place, and believing in the spiritual, like all of the powerful institutions hate that right now. <laughs> like they, they are against literally one by one against all of those things and all of them are universally right against it. So like, I guess what does West Virginia look like in 25 years if I get my way? Well, like we've shattered the, the, shattered the, like, the progressive institutions, right? And like reconstituted like a world where like people can just have a good life, can, can, work 40 hours you know like they, they don't have to they don't have to kill themselves to make six figures they don't have to like do all this stuff they're just like comfortable you know and like doing the things that makes us human uh yeah like uh, senator session said last night uh we represent the people not the gdp right mm -hmm. so like i just want the i want the the people uh to just be able to live out their teleological ends or what have you. So. That's, that's the other cool thing that he said too that was really sticking with me that I was going to bring up was he said, you know, 
up in the up in the north we call they call it farms here in the south we call it a place, place. yeah yeah like yes. it, it's the sessions place Absolutely. you know is Absolutely. is is his house and i spent a lot of time uh thinking about that um you know it's it's um, i think it's very encouraging to me as we kind of wrap up here that mm -hmm. um you know as people like uh Senator Sessions and, and some of these older folks are kind of retiring from, you know, uh, public service and entering into a more political life that there's kind of a, uh, a young generation of people taking up his mantle, you know, and, and, and trying to, um, you know, give people a sense of, of place and belonging. So really appreciate everything you do, man. Well I, well, I appreciate you having me. And this is exactly what I shared with Mrs. Sessions last mm -hmm. night. As I said, like, listen, like, take heart, like the future looks a lot more like your husband than anybody else. So, Absolutely. Uh, and that's Inshallah. Encouraging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Lord, Lord willing. willing. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> oh my God. Very good. Riley, how can people find out more about you? Keep up to date with you. Uh, you know, probably with great interest. Uh, sure. Hopefully, we've introduced you to to a lot of people who are going to be big fans of yours. Well, We're going to like double your Twitter. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, I, hopefully, yeah, yeah. I would love it. The Twitter at Riley Keaton W V R I L E Y K E A T O N W V uh, RileyKeaton.com. Uh, yeah, there. Yeah, that's about my availability. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Riley. Thank you. I appreciate you all so much. Thank you. So you're hitched. Yeah, it rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you listening in, uh, we just got Nick married here about a week and a half ago. Two weeks now, I guess. Two, two weeks. Two whole two weeks. Two weeks tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, the whole team, uh, a couple board members of ours, we went down along with friends and family of, of the, the Solheim clan uh, to, to Dunn, North Carolina to celebrate Nick and Evie's uh, marriage. It's hard not to... Not to feel like this is an American momenty thing because it, it coincided them first starting a date coincided with the origins of this organization so much and yeah she always talks about how when we first started dating because we let's see it was like April of 2020 mm -hmm. that we started talking about this and Evie and I started going on dates like late May early mm -hmm. June yeah. back when you still weren't really supposed to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the thing, right? Like when people bring this up to her, like, oh, wow, you've seen like America moment grow. And, and she's like the first couple of weeks, like he wouldn't tell me about it. He would, <laughs> he would just say, I'm working on this super secret project. And it's like the coolest thing ever, but I can't tell you about it. Yeah. And now she's my wife. So I can't yeah. uh, keep yeah. secrets. Yeah, he keeps anymore. on saying my wife every single chance. Yeah. It's like a very enjoyable phrase. You yeah. know, Senator Sessions was telling me last night that that wears off with time. But <laughs> uh, but for now, I'm enjoying saying my wife. Yeah. So it's Z very cool. Where'd you guys go on your honeymoon? Uh, so we were out in the mountains in Western North Carolina at an undisclosed location uh, because I do not want to dox my uh in-laws vacation home. <laughs> uh but we spent a lot of time in the, in the in the mountains out there we uh we uh you know drove a little ways and 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 went on a uh moonshine train tour of the yeah. mountains I, I got a text message <laughs> at 10 a.m the monday after the wedding which was on a saturday saying uh well actually i'm gonna find it because it was one of the funniest things i've ever read uh and it did very well on on the twitter machine as well um, let's see. You have if way too I many can. text screens. I know, I know. I'm I'm really <laughs> bad about that. I just uh I, I tend to we are on a five hour moonshine train tour in the mountains. I've had seven shots of moonshine. That was a text message they got at ten fifty nine AM on a Monday. <laughs> yeah, it was it was very funny because after you posted that, uh my buddy Hunter texted me and he said, I just got a call from uh Sarab about uh, uh, our like American Moments marketing email performance and I'm seeing that Nick's like day drinking on a Monday. Is it upside down day? You know? <laughs> Feels like the roles are reversed. Yeah, because Nick is um, uh, a teetotaling Baptist and so there yeah. was no alcohol at the wedding. You had yeah. a coffee bar. <laughs> and it was so great. People loved it. I was up till 3 a.m. I had to drive the next day. It's not my fault that you can't control yourself. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> yes, we did have a coffee bar. Uh, 
uh, at the wedding, we had a, a place called Sir Walter. Uh, it's a coffee shop in Raleigh, North Carolina, named after Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, and they did uh, like an espresso and cold brew bar. So they did like drinks with uh, like cold brew, espresso, whipped cream, and like peanut butter. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like really delicious mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did hors d'oeuvres. We had uh, cake. Um it was a, it was a great wedding, and it was very in a, in a in a very like southern fashion. We like had the wedding, had a ton of fun. We were so elegant. Everyone said we were beautiful, and then we went to cookout with the bridal <laughs> party and like ate burgers in the parking lot. Yeah, it was so. great. We and that was I, I think that may have been my favorite part of the wedding was just like hanging yeah. out in the parking lot of cookout, eating junk food, and just vibing. It was a good time. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to pay like you know, $600 to dry clean my wife's dress for our future daughters. But, you know, it's, I'm serious. We really kind of tore up the, 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 the like trail of her wedding gown. Well, but uh, that sounds like a you problem. Um, yeah. I think it's important to, to recognize that, um, you know, the weekend was a little bit traumatic for some of us. Uh, Jake was mortified when uh, members of the Fordham family specifically kept on coming up and saying, we love Moment of Truth. So Rob and Nick are great. And he, yeah. I could just see him like more and more horrified as the day went on. He was like, why do all these people listen to you every week? And I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I can't answer that either. I don't even listen to us. Like this is the, I'm listening right now, you know, as it, I, you're the psychotic person that goes through and listens to the episode again. I've already you got, endured it you, once. You got a Monday morning quarterback, these things. Um, anyway, uh, feel free to send your congratulations to Nick and Evie Solheim um, uh, on the Twitter machine or email them or whatever you'd like. Or uh, you can put your congratulations in a five-star review, which we would Ooh. very much like for you to do. Yes. Uh, and if you do, you'll be entered um, to uh, win a free shirt. Uh, we're giving out a couple of those uh, with American Moment brand on them. Uh, we'll send it to you. Just shoot us an email at podcast at americanmoment.org with the screenshot of the review. Uh, we'll give a couple of those out over the next couple of weeks. Uh, it should be a good time. I am also saying that there are like five or six items left unpurchased on my registry. So <laughs> if you want to email me, nick at americanmoment.org and uh, you know you, you purchase should... a gift from my registry, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to provide you with a I, I disavow this call to um, <laughs> send Nick personal gifts um if you'd like to donate to american moments you can do that instead um, you can also donate it to it vicariously <laughs> by getting me a wedding gift yeah yeah no that's not how that works anyway um thank you guys for listening we hope you enjoyed this episode um hard to believe i mean we're now in numbers that feel unreal like late 30s in terms of how many podcasts we've done it's really uh, been that many yeah i mean oh we're gosh we, we, we see the the first 50 episodes as kind of a set um or what really the first year of the podcast and we're, we're coming up on doing this for about a year and it's uh it's really wild to think about it's been so much fun and every week we get to sit down with just someone cool who we look up to and enjoy talking to it's a blessing and a pleasure so i'm gonna put the pressure on right here Episode 50 has to be someone awesome. Yeah. I we Well, we, we know who episode 50 is going to be. We can talk about it uh, another oh, time. Yeah. Well, um, I guess you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who it's going to be. It will be someone special that we are particularly saving for that episode. So I uh, already got some fantastic things in the works. If you have guest suggestions, feel free to send them our way. Um, Podcast if, at AmericanMoment.org. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll take it a lot more seriously if you send us a five-star review with it. Just uh, <laughs> It really helps, guys. Like, look, uh, we are shocked by how many people listen to this. I mean, like, it's like thousands and thousands of you listen to this every week. Um, but we want more. So uh, reviewing really helps that happen. So uh, thank you guys for listening. You guys are awesome. Uh, love it when you guys say hello if you're in D.C. or elsewhere. Um, uh, if you see us at National Conservatism Conference, be sure to come say hi. Yes. Um, uh, we, we're, we're traveling around a lot the next couple of weeks. Um, come get an American Moment pin from us. Yeah. yeah uh, come, come represent. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.